Hello everybody, this is the fourth video in behavioral sciences. We'll start by talking about confounding bias today. This is one of the important concepts to understand. So what's confounding bias? It occurs when the exposure disease or the exposure outcome relationship is explained, can be explained by another variable, which is the confounder. And this variable must be associated independently with both the exposure and the outcome. So when we have, we have the exposure usually that leads to an outcome, which is a disease. But here, the confounder, which is another variable, is associated with both. It affects the exposure and it affects the disease by itself. So let's look at an example here. When you're studying the effect of maternal alcohol consumption on low birth weight, they found that smoking is a confounder. Why is that? Because smoking by itself is associated with more alcohol consumption. Smokers consume more alcohol. And smoking by itself can cause low birth weight. So we cannot conclude that in this study that maternal alcohol is the cause of low birth weight. So how, we do, how do we eliminate confounder? Or how do we minimize it? There are, uh, there are certain ways that we do in studies. One of them is randomization, matching, and stratification or stratified analysis. What is matching? So we try to match the variables that we can match between both groups, like the age, the sex, the race. We try to match these variables between both groups. Another way is by randomization. We try to randomize the variables or the confounders between both groups so they are equal they, and they're balanced. And this way randomization helps us also to account for unknown risk factors like the socioeconomic status that are hard to match sometimes. Let's look at another example and how can we use something called stratified analysis or stratification. So in this case, we, alcohol, they found in a study that alcohol, alcoholics appear to get more lung cancer than non-alcoholics. But they found that the smoker is a confounder. Why? Because smokers drink more alcohol and smoking by itself also causes, is a cause of lung cancer. So what's the way of doing that in a study? How, how do we get to this result that smoking is a confounder? They use something called stratified analysis, where they divide the groups into smokers and non-smokers and see the relative risk. Is it the same or is it changed? So in this example, they found that alcoholics and non-alcoholics, at the beginning they found that alcoholics and non-alcoholics and the effect of lung cancer, people with lung cancer and non-lung cancer, if we did the relative risk as we did before, the exposed group and the non-exposed group, we'll, found that we'll find that the relative risk here is 5. That means that we might think that there is 5 times chance that alcoholics will get lung cancer than non-alcoholics. But when they divided the group into two groups, smokers and non-smokers, and did the same analysis again, alcoholics and non-alcoholics who have lung cancer and don't have lung cancer, they found that the relative risk in both groups is the same. So they concluded that the effect of lung cancer is eliminated after stratified analysis by smokers and non-smokers. Another concept that we have to differentiate from confounders, something, that, something that's called effect modification. Here, the effect of the main exposure on an outcome is modified by another variable. But here the modifier affects mainly the exposure, doesn't affect the disease by itself. Let's see. It's not a bias, but it's or confounders. It is a natural phenomenon that we have to account for and study and know it. So let's talk about an example here. 
the effect of oral contraceptive pills on breast cancer. They found that it is modified by family history. That women who have positive family history have increased risk of breast cancer when taking OCP, while those without family history don't have increased an increased risk. Another example is the effect of an estrogen receptor agonist on the incidence of DVT, which they found that it is modified by smoking status. That if smokers are taking the drug, they will have increased risk of DVT. But while non-smokers taking the same drug, they don't have an increased risk of DVT. So we said that we have to differentiate it from confounders by dividing the groups in, by dividing it into subgroups that stratified analysis that we talked about before. In this case, if they found smoker, smoking is a confounder, smoking has to be associated by itself with, with the exposure and the outcome. So it has to be associated by itself with increased risk of DVT. Let's see another example of effect modifications. So let's see that drug A causes increased risk of DVT, but it is modified by gene X. So gene X is the modifier. People who have gene X have increased risk, while those who ha don't have gene X shouldn't have increased risk when taking drug A. So let's do the stratified analysis again in here. So when we do the 2 by 2 table, people who take drug A and people who don't, and people who have DVT and people who, don't, who are not having DVT, we found that the relative risk is 5. So it means, so in here, that people who take drug A are 5 times more likely to develop DVT. But when we did the stratified analysis between the two groups, gene X and those without gene X, we found that those with gene X, the relative risk persists. It's the same as the initial results. The relative risk is 5, while those without gene X is eliminated. There is no increased risk. So this is the difference. When we did it with the other group, with the uh, confounders, the risk was eliminated in both groups. But here the risk persists with the modifier. Let's talk now about something called the null hypothesis. So the null hypothesis says there is no relationship between the exposure and the outcome. Example that the drug we're studying doesn't have the effect or it doesn't or it's not working. We don't like the null hypothesis. We're all, we always try to reject the null hypothesis in order in order to prove that our drug works or there is a relationship between the exposure and the outcome. And here comes the alternative hypothesis that that says there is a relationship between the exposure and the outcome. So try to understand this that we the null hypothesis is something that we are always trying to reject not to prove and it says there is no relationship between the drug the exposure and the outcome. So one way we do is using the p-value or the alpha criterion. What's the p-value or alpha, the alpha criterion? It's usually 0.05 or 5%. That means it's the it's the maximum amount of error that we are willing to accept when we're doing a study. That's 5%. So we're willing to accept that although we did our study and but in each study, in this study that we did, there were 5%, there is a 5% chance that the study is due to error. So, if the p-value or the alpha criterion is 0 0.05, and we calculate our own p-value, if it is less, we're always trying to get below the p-value. If it is less than 0 0.05, let's see here 0 0.02, then we, are all, we're, we say that there is a relationship 
The reason relationship means that we can reject the null hypothesis. But by doing so, when we say there is a relationship and we rejected the null hypothesis, we acknowledge that there is a risk of committing an error. And this error is called type 1 or alpha error. So we say there is a relationship. What's the error that we are going to commit? The, the alpha error is there isn't a relationship. So what we did is wrong. This is the alpha error or type 1 error. In the contrary here, if the p-value is something higher than our the computed p-value, it's 0.13 in here, we cannot reject the null hypothesis. That means there is no relationship. We concluded that there is no relationship between the exposure and the outcome or the drug that does not work. We're risking committing type 2 error type 2 or beta error, that although we say it, the drug doesn't work, in fact, it, wa it is working. So this is beta error. So let's talk about them here. What's type 1 error? So when we rejected the null hypothesis, and we said that our drug really works, but the drug in reality doesn't work or in reality there is no relationship between the exposure and the outcome. So if there is a study that concluded that candy improves the heart failure mortality, but it doesn't, but the study concluded that it did this. So this study committed a type 1 or alpha error. What's type 2 error? When we fail to reject the null hypothesis and we say there is no relationship between the drug and the effect or the exposure and the effect but we, there, is an, there is a relationship and we should, we should have rejected this so this is type 2 error and beta is the probability of committing type 2 error so if beta is 0.2 then there is 20% chance to accept the null hypothesis when it's false the drug works What's the power? The power, which equals 1 minus beta, it is the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis, proving the drug works, which we want to do when it is truly false that the drug works. We increase the power by increasing the sample size or the inf increasing the effect size that we are studying, looking for something big, or by making the alpha criterion easier. So in the previous case, we said that there is, the beta is 0.2, there's 20 chance to accept that the null hypothesis, to accept, then here, beta is, the power is 1 minus beta, 1 minus 0.2, which is 0.8. So the power here is 80%. 80% of rejecting the null hypothesis or 80% chance of proving the relationship. So I know that when talking about it, it may seem confusing, but it is not really confusing. So let's summarize it again, the null hypothesis. So the null hypothesis is, is something that says there is no relationship between the exposure and the outcome, it says that the drug we're studying doesn't work. So we always want to reject the null hypothesis to prove the relationship between the exposure and the outcome. To reject the null hypothesis, we use a standardized p-value, 0.05, that we say there is 5% chance of getting uh, of our results being due to chance. So we're always trying to get the p-value below this 0.05. If it is below, then we can reject the null hypothesis and prove the relationship between the exposure and the outcome and say our drug works. But we risk committing an error, which is type 1 error or alpha error. On the other side, if we couldn't 
get below the standard p-value, then we do not reject the null hypothesis and we conclude that our drug doesn't work or there is no relationship between the exposure and the outcome, but we risk committing type 2 error or beta error, which is the probability, the beta, of committing type 2 error. Then we have another concept, which is the power, and which is 1 minus beta. It is the capacity to detect the difference. How do we increase the power? By increasing the sample size, increasing the effect size, making an easier alpha criterion. The example that we said before, if beta is 0.2 or 20%, there is 20% chance of committing type 2 error. And our power, which is 1 minus beta, is 80%. 80% chance of rejecting the null hypothesis and proving there is a difference or proving our drug works.